welcome to our webinar. The ability to act with compassion is one of the most important keys to a sustainable working life, but still it's very difficult to enact. This is what we're going to talk about today. My name is Henrika Frank, and my research uh, interest is within organizational ethics, specifically in how we relate to one another in organizations. And I am Jan Nols. I'm a scriptwriter and a film researcher and lecturer. I work with stories, how they work and how they Im impact us. I'm especially interested in the links between storytelling, empathy and compassion. Today, we are going to break some of the myths asso associated with compassion and also share four personal stories of compassion from our own working life. We both work in Helsinki, Finland, at the Arcada University of Applied Sciences, uh, which is part of the Re-Inherit project. During this webinar, you may ask questions in the chat, and uh, we will do our utmost to answer them. So I started out by saying that the ability to act with compassion is one of the most important keys to a sustainable working life. Let's dig deep, deeper into this. So compassion can be defined as the ability to see the other person's needs, the other person's suffering, and also joy. But specifically what we're looking at is to act upon this feeling. And we know from research that acting compassionately contributes to an organizational's financial resilience and retention of customer and staff. Compassion's, compassion feeds creativity, learning and well-being, which in turn then contributes to a more sustainable working life and even competitive advantage. So an organization that encourages acts of compassion has a positive impact on innovation, collaboration and willingness to change when needed. Still, we know that acts of compassion are rare. Why is this? Often, when we teach people uh, in their professions, we have concentrated on the rational and the cognitive, as if it were only a matter of intellectual understanding. We, we assume that we need frameworks, rules and codes of conduct and then we know the right thing to do. Don't get us wrong, we need these rules and codes of conduct too. But we believe we missed something of the natural human element. The natural ability to show compassion in action. But as we mentioned earlier, it has been shown that an organization that invests in, in talking about compassion and in showing compassion also ends up with a better result and better well-being. Still, it is difficult and we wonder why. A lot of it comes down to the myths that surround compassion. So, myths of compassion. What are these? We need to break them. Here are some of the myths we have about compassion. It makes me look weak. Compassion is something you either have or you don't have, that you're kind of born with it or not. Compassion creates injustice or we don't need compassion because we have rules. So let's look more closely what these myths mean. Compassion makes me look weak. The myth is that you cannot show compassion because it makes you look weak. You're supposed to be advancing, say, a workplace or an organization's cause, and you shouldn't mix it with your emotion and specifically not bring in such things as pain and suffering. You don't want to bring up difficult things. The difficult things can stay at home. 
Uh, this brings us to our first story um, that we want to share with you. And this one is uh, from my own working life. Um, the title of the story is Shoelaces. So, um, so this is a true story, just as you know. Um, so for a period of 10 years, um, I was a film uh, teacher here at Arcada, and I was responsible for an exchange program between Finland and Africa. Apart from teaching and admin, I also had to take care of the well-being of the students involved. It was a lot of fun, but it was also constant problem solving every year for a period of three months. The, the experience, the exchange program taught me a lot about understanding otherness and also about compassion. It also literally broke my back because every year the same thing happened. When the exchange was nearing its end, it was usually in the beginning of June, the same period we are in now, and everything, productions, final reports, examinations came to their head, I got severe lower back pain. I couldn't sit or walk properly, and I definitely could not pick up a pen from the floor and stairs were the absolute worst. This condition made me feel weak and old, and I tried to hide it best I could. It feels odd to say it loud, but I felt ashamed to be in pain. I knew that it was a symptom of stress and that it wasn't my fault, but I still felt shame. One year was especially bad. The summer had arrived in Helsinki and the students were done with their projects. I had arranged for a final feedback session on an island outside Helsinki. I made all the preparation and it was said to be an emotional, beautiful day. The sun was out and the sea was gorgeous, but I could not enjoy any of it since my back was killing me. Uh, I took the strongest painkiller I had to no effect. I thought to myself that I should just quit, stop doing this and find some other line of work to do. So I was set to take the small, a small ferry to the island with the students, but since I could not move properly, the walk to the ferry took forever and I missed the boat. I sat down and waited for the next one and then one of the students, Nora, showed up. She also had missed the ferry. We talked a bit about her project and her experience and I pretended to be okay. Everything I could think of was lying down and, and I uh, dreamt of some miracle cure. Finally, the ferry arrived and, and uh, we w went on board and Nora suggested we sit outside on the upper deck. I looked up and I saw the stairs leading up to the deck. In my mind, I said, no, please, no stairs. But I faked a smile and, and said yes. When we got up, I was sweating and, and I gingerly sat down. There we sat, us two and a few tourists. Nora sat opposite me and said to me, your shoelaces are untied. I looked down and she was right. I also knew that it was impossible for me to do anything about the shoelaces. I shrugged and, and looked at the horizon. Even the way I sat felt awkward and wrong. Then Nora said casually, are you okay? I saw a tiny window opening and suddenly I told her about my damn back, how it is impossible to bend down and how the pain draws a damp curtain over everything and that nothing matters and I just want to quit everything. Nora looked at me for a long time. She smiled and went down on her knees and then she tied my shoelaces. The tourists looked on in bewilderment. They obviously had no clue what was going on. So I've often told this story as a funny story, a, a way to laugh at myself and the absurdity of human existence. But since I've learned more about compassion. This episode has gotten a different kind of significance for me. Uh, Nora's small gesture of compassion and kindness spoke to something greater. 
by her act of tying my shoelaces, Nora taught me two fundamental things about teaching, learning and life. Firstly, it's all right to be weak. It is all right to be in pain. And perhaps more importantly, her action told me that I was not alone with my pain. So I did not quit. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, the myth was that compassion makes me look weak. But you showed weakness. Why was it so difficult to show weakness in that situation? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think part of it is, is, uh, was due to the hierarchy of the situation. Uh, where I was the teacher, uh, supposed to be in control and supposed to care, take care of things, and Nora was the student. So in this instance, I think it was Nora who, who was the brave one. She actually um, challenged the hierarchy and, and uh, asked me if I was okay, and also um, showed compassion to me, even though I was her teacher and, and in a sort of authority position to her. So I think that was a, a key part of the, the that encounter so i think this is a good example of the fact that we are we're afraid to show weakness we think we are we somehow cannot show it because and we don't want compassion because that's also weak but the truth is and this is shown in many research uh, endeavors and also through the art story that compassion actually makes you stronger and in your story also, I think you both felt stronger after this encounter. So compassion is not a weakness. In fact, when we have the courage to show it, it does make us stronger. And it's a virtue and it's a quality that demonstrates strength of character, which Nora had. And that serves cooperation. And if we talk about organizations, it serves organization, but we could even say that it serves all humanity. Because our ability to give and receive help has been at the core of human evolution. Why should it be a weakness now? So compassion does prevent understanding and prevents conflict from growing. It promotes understanding. In any case, I think here it's worth mentioning that too much compassion can be bad for the individual if you take on board too much of another person's suffering. And this can be a challenge, particularly in caring professions. Um, we have something called compassion fatigue, but studies show that it's more rare in other professions, though not impossible. So let's go to the next myth. And this is compassion is something we either have or we don't have. So this myth is about personality traits, a myth that claims that you can somehow categorize people into those with compassion and those without. But things are not that black and white. And I know this is actually a controversial issue with a lot of history, and it has a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of emotion. Are people essentially good or evil? I myself have given this a lot of thought and read many different theories on the subject. And for a long time, the idea of the normality of evil has been prevalent. A concept coined particularly by the philosopher Hannah Arendt when she observed the trials of the post-Nazi -Nazi regime. So she concluded that any family man could do terrible things with little manipulation. So this theory says that it, a civilized, polite person is only a thin layer on the surface. Underneath is what we call reality, a selfish animal driven by its instincts. And there is also a number of studies, old studies in social psychology that kind of tries to prove this point. Um, you're perhaps familiar with the Stanford prison experiment in the 70s, which concluded that everyone is capable of evil. All it takes is the right circumstances, like a uniform or Milgram's obedience test in the 60s, which came to the horrifying conclusion that an ordinary person would kill an innocent bystander if told to. 
in this experiment, subject were supposed to electrocute a student if the student answered incorrectly. In the end, the electric shock was lethal. So the subject thought that they were in a learning experiment at Yale and the electric shock was supposed to promote learning. But little did they know that there was no electricity and the student was an actor. So these kinds, or actually these two experiments, which you might have heard of even, uh, have long been seen as so-called proof that you can only be good if you're forced to, as it were, or if you well were kind of led. But shows that underneath there's a lot of historical prejudice and outdated science. Today, today we know that Philip Zimbardo, in his Stanford prison experiment, pressured his students who had been chosen as prison guards to behave cruelly, and that the subject in Milgram's obedience test did not blindly obey. They were manipulated into thinking that they were doing good. But this kind human image did not sell after the atrocities of the Second World War, and it doesn't really sell even now, even though that there, are incre there is increasing evidence that people want to do good. Of course, man is capable of evil too. History has proven that. One explanation is our second nature to trust the familiar and beware of the unfamiliar. It's a trait that has been imprinted us on us during our breeding, like a tailbone, something we no longer need. And that's why we want to believe in the evil man. It's kind of liberating, it's easy. Bad things happen because we are bad. But it is not like that. We can choose. So there is more and more evidence that people fundamentally want to do good and be good. What does this mean for compassion? Do we think that others are greedy, cruel, selfish, and at the very least capable of being led into evil? After all, we ourselves are good. At least we have a good excuse when we are not. But what if we believed the same about others? If we believed that others want good, they may be able to influence, we may be able to influence others. And here I think Jan has a story again that maybe illustrates this point. Yes, um, our second story is indeed about choice and how uh, a particular person's choices influence others. Um, it was the same exchange program I mentioned earlier. Uh, and one year, a student from Zimbabwe, uh, her name was Tapiwa, was selected to take part in the program. Uh, she was set to, to spend three months in Finland. Um, I learned uh, a bit later on that Tapiwa, when she was a small child, had been left behind in Zimbabwe by her family when her parents had to move to London because uh, of uh, because the financial and and uh, social situation in Zimbabwe was very bad at the time, and uh, Tapiwa was brought up by her grandmother. Later, uh, Tapiwa started studying in a, in a film school, while also at the same time she had a child of her own. So when when Tapiwa was chosen to take part in the exchange program. Mm, she committed herself to be away for three months. And this commitment involved leaving her young infant child behind, since she could not take the child with her due to visa constraints and, and uh, also because she was supposed to study full time abroad. Uh, so in a way, Tapiwa's choice uh, was the same as her parents. Uh, and her situation when she arrived in Finland also came to mirror uh, that of the subjects of a documentary story she and, and a group of other students uh, worked, came to work on in Finland. The documentary film they, they made uh, in, uh, involved the Neziris, uh, a refugee family from the Balkans, 
And that family also had left a, a child behind, their two-year-old son, when they had to flee the country. So these personal backgrounds mirrored each other, and, and the personal history of Tapiwa allowed her and subsequently the whole film crew to empathize with the Naziri family on multiple levels. It proved to be uh, key as it allowed her, Tapiwa and the others to understand the subject on an emotional level. I interviewed Tapiwa later on in 2015, where she reconnected with the experience and how her personal background helped her in understanding others. I quote her now from the interview. I understood and felt their pain, loss and grief over being separated from their child and finding acceptance in a foreign country. So I cried when they cried and I laughed when they laughed. The things that the Nasiri faced were similar to what my family went through. They were like kindred spirits. As a filmmaker, I was sensitive to what we needed to say and how to say it. So in the end, it became a collaborative process between the Naziris and us." End of quote. So this empathy that Tapiwa describes and what she experienced, thanks to her personal history, also influenced uh, how the story was told. I, I think I, I always remember this, this uh, story because the film itself, the film they made about the refugee family in Finland, uh, ended up becoming an animated documentary, documentary um, in which the characters were drawn by the family themselves. And the film itself became sort of an, an act of compassion, as it also helped the family to deal with their trauma and guilt, as well as being a successful film that gave a new perspective on the experience of ref refugees in Finland. Thank you, Jan. Uh how do you think this story, how do you, how does it connect to the myth that as compassion would be something that we are either born with or not? I, I think uh, in my mind it is because Tapiwa, uh, the, the sort of main character in the story, uh, has had gone through such an enormous amount of trauma and, and pain and suffering in her own life, both as a child and as a parent. Uh, and she had all the, 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 the reasons to, to become um, sort of uh, bitter and, 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 and sort of uh, resentful towards the world. world. But the people cho cho chose a completely different path. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she embraced others' pain and others' suffering. And also, which I think is even more uh, somehow impressive, is that she, she communicated this to, to the other students and, and that they together acted upon this, this suffering. In this case, in the, in the, the act was, was uh, a filmmaking process and the, the production of the film. Uh, so I think that is why I, I think this connects very strongly to, to the questions we have around compassion. Yes. So I think this was a clear, she chose to see the good in the human. So, this myth is not true. The truth is that compassion is a natural human trait. It's not something you're either born with or not. And there is not only a thin layer between the well-behaving people and some kind of animal cruelty. The truth is that only fairy tale characters are somehow black and white. In real life, it's very much the environment and how we view others that shapes how we behave. So if we believe that others want good, we may better be able to work in a more compassionate world. So let's go to the third myth. Compassion creates injustice. If I care about that one, then I must care about others in the same way. So it's best to be emotionally neutral to everyone. This is based on the idea that compassion somehow means making concessions all the time and it, that it presses for demands. Did you have a story on this too? Yes, uh, a short story that, um, that uh, came, um, came to the fore uh, when 
myself and Henrika and, and a group of other colleagues uh, from different disciplines here at Arcada. So we decided uh, to, to create a course around empathy and compassion since we all felt that, that uh, these, um, these questions that we talk about are, are central to all of our, our different professions and, and research interests. So this course we created uh, was called Compassion at Work, uh, and it had students and staff from healthcare, nursing, midwives, but also students from film and media. And during the course, uh, we encouraged the, the participants to, to, to tell real life stories from their own working uh, life experiences. And one story was particularly uh, interesting. It concerned a, a nurse. Uh, this nurse was a student at our course, and she had previously worked in an elderly nursing home. And of course, that nursing home reality can be quite stressful. And and uh, and she had this nurse had particularly um, she had. Um, trouble with an aggressive um, elderly patient's husband who often came to visit uh, his wife who was in the nursing home and, and he acted very aggressive and hostile towards the staff. He, he was always in a bad mood and, and, uh, and it became a problem for the staff. So now I quote the nurse how she, how she told uh, of, a, of a change in the relationship. I quote, one particular bad day when his wife was in a very bad way and he was and the the husband was taking out his pain on us nurses i suddenly asked him if he wanted a beer we kept some beer in the fridge for special occasions they were rarely served and they were never served to re relatives but the husband, he, he seemed so sad. We sat down, he drank the beer, and we talked about his wife and their life together. End of quote. But the real uh, mm, sort of moral of the story is what happened afterwards. The nurse continues. Uh, the next time we met, the husband's aggressive attitude against us nurses as caregivers was gone. So the nurse break, broke the rules in order to show compassion. Surely it's not okay to serve beer in a nursing home. No, no. Why do you think the man relaxed? Well, we discussed this in class uh, with the student and, and uh, I think in this instance, uh, when the nurse broke uh, a certain code of conduct and, and the sort of uh, normal way of doing things, she also um, um, reminded the husband that the nurse is also a, a, a person, a human being, and not only a nurse. And this allowed for the for for the two individuals in this story to, to get closer together. And uh, this broke down some sort of inhibition and, and, and wall. Uh, and uh, and I, I believe also helped the husband in his pain over, over his wife that was sick. So the myth was that compassion creates injustice. And, and, but this doesn't, this story, it doesn't mean that everyone now is served beer in this nursing home but it opened up a communication that was rare because she broke the rules, but not meaning that everybody should get beer. So the truth is that compassion increases justice because it frees the people to be seen as whole people with everything they bring from the rest of their lives. So most of the time you don't need to do so much. Listening and understanding are enough. The fourth myth, we don't need compassion because we have rules. I have 
good principles. It will be good. Rules are there so we can work together. The right behavior is based on analytical and rational thinking. But yet it's important to understand that every day we are in situations where we have a choice to show compassion. Yet we think of these situations as if they were exceptions. I somehow see it as us sitting with our heads down, doing our job, and then something happens. Our colleagues ask us to do something, a customer comes, something comes, and we immediately get the feeling and intuition that we should maybe react with our emotion, it could be compassion, but then our so-called rationalizations kick in. They can be, for example, I don't know this person very well, it's intrusive to say something, or in this organization, we are rational and objective. You should leave your private life at home. It's not my responsibility to think about this. I just work here. So all these rationalizations rush into our heads before we even had a chance to think about how we could maybe behave differently. We become somehow like a deer in the headlights and just want to get out of the situations as quickly as possible and do as we have learned to do, not show emotion. And this happens because we think compassion is somehow outside of life at work, at least. Did you have a story about this too? Yes, uh, uh, this story um, is, uh, is also that it came up in the same course I mentioned. And it concerns a very familiar situation to anybody who's, who has um, worked in a, in a school or at a university. It was a, a, a situation where a group of students had, had an important presentation that they were giving to, to, to a group of lecturers. Um, and mm, and uh, unfortunately, the presentation did not uh, apparently go so well, and, and they received very harsh criticism from the lecturers. And one of the group members suddenly mm, felt very anxious, and, and uh, this person was, was unable to continue the presentation. And this person had to leave the classroom in the middle of said presentation. The rest of the group um, then had a choice and they, they carried on with their presentation without the person in, in distress, except for one member of, of, of this group who felt the need to act. She, she told it like this, I acted instinctively. I followed the person in distress outside and then I hugged the person. I felt I had to do something. I did it even though we weren't that close. Afterwards, I wonder if it had been okay to hug the person or if I had overstepped. And what about the consequences? What happened after the unexpected hug? Uh, the hugger continues her story. That hug actually changed a lot. Afterwards, there was a noteworthy positive change in our group dynamic, and we worked much better together as a group afterwards. So you would say that the normal behavior would have been to ignore this. But um, what did the person who hugged, what did he or she risk by doing it? Um, I think um, she, she risked a certain, like, Nowadays, we talk a lot about uh, like personal space and, and not to, to sort of, uh, and, and, and I think she risked a, a, a sort of, um, that she would somehow um, infringe on the person and, 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 and make the situation worse. But in this instance, um, somehow the, uh, this, uh, her reaction was natural. And I think also what is interesting in this story is that, uh, is that, she made a choice and the others also made a choice to continue and then one person made a different choice which goes back to what we spoke earlier that uh, oftentimes in our everyday lives we are met with choices mm -hmm. so could you talk a bit more about the consequences of these acts of compassion 
Yeah, I I think these everyday acts of compassion, even though they on the surface seem quite small, uh, in, in some way they confirm what um, uh, social psychologist Jonathan Haidt has, has argued, that people are often surprised and, and moved by, by simple acts of generosity and compassion. He, he suggests that, that such small moments actually give rise to a, a, a unique emotion that he chooses to call elevation, uh, which means that when we receive or witness or even hear of small acts of compassion, we tend to feel a, a pleasurable physical feeling in, in the chest and, and something warm, and it's a, sort of an opening. And it's oftentimes coupled with a desire to engage in, in such acts, virtuous act, acts oneself. So basically what Haidt and us two argue is that, that kindness makes us feel good and that it's highly contagious. And still, we believe that rules are more important than giving these hugs. So the truth is that rules can prevent us from showing compassion. But we have to remember that we always carry the potential for compassion with us. But we often rationalize our behavior kind of after the fact that we didn't act upon it. Um, thus far, we have talked mostly about uh, people, uh, their working life and, their, um, and, and how compassion works in organizations. But uh, Henrika, you've also uh, encountered another area um, where compassion is relevant, the, our relationships to nature. Yes. So I've been also looking at how people relate compassionately to, to nature, to other living animals. And, and this is very interesting because we need this for our Earth now. And, but this compassion towards the nature seems to have the same problem. We are not, we don't dare to talk about it. So um, one of the person I talked with when I did this research was an artist called Sofia. And her story was that here in this city in Helsinki, we have a big park, an iconic park in the center. And one day, trees in one avenue were all like tens of trees, over a hundred year old trees were, were felled while they get cut down. And Sophia knew that this would make her sick. She couldn't even go there first. But then she remembered a quote from a Spanish artist who said, when you cannot do anything to change a circumstance, do at least something, do a mindless art act. So what she did was she took a camera, she went to the park for a few weeks and asked people how they felt about the trees. Surprisingly, over 70% said that cutting down the trees was terrible. They had crowded and mourned and they had felt pain in their bodies. And she told them that there's nothing you can do now, but she said that please stand on the on the stump and imagine that you get the power from this hundred year old tree. And she took pictures of all these people. And she did an exhibition, which then toured in Finland. And the most surprising might have been the response she got on this tour. So many people contacted her saying, this is the first time I understand that I'm not alone when I cry over a tree being felt cut down on my yard. And even people who work with cutting down trees felt this. So it was horrible that to know that people who for tens of years have been working as uh, taking down trees, they still feel the pain. And people were embarrassed. This opened up something. It was a myth. You cannot talk about it. So it also applies to nature. We have broken down four myths about compassion. So the truth is compassion makes us stronger, not weaker. Compassion is a natural human trait. It's not something you must learn. Man is not born evil. Man is good. 
Compassion frees everyone to be whole. It does not create injustice. And rules can prevent us from showing compassion. Rules are not an alternative to compassion. So through this, these stories, and by breaking the myths, we can see that to do this, to do compassionate acts, we are breaking hierarchies. We are breaking cycles of personal trauma to make something good. We are breaking rules. We are breaking social norms. And this leads us to the tentative, but potentially very compelling conclusion that compassion is a rebellious act. So compassion has this transformative power that can challenge the status quo and also disrupt the prevailing narratives that we think we have. Often the narratives are kind of about indifference and self-centeredness. And now in a world that glorifies individualism and competition, these acts of compassion can really defy societal norms and even redefine what it means to be human. Compassion requires courage. Do you want to say something more? Um, yeah, I, I think um, I think compassion uh, offers also an uh, uh, alternative path to, to to conflict resolution by emphasizing understanding, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Oftentimes in, in situations where anger or indifference may be the expected responses, choosing compassion becomes an act of rebellion against the cycles of indifference or aggression. So compassion as a rebellious act is, is a call to action, urging every one of us to, to step outside the confines of outside expectations. Uh, and lastly, before we invite questions, we'd ask you to, to visit the, the website we recently launched. We call it storiesofcompassion.com. Um, and here our ambition is to, to, to gather similar personal stories that we also share here today from different work, working environments and, and, and different organizations and contexts also to encourage more acts of compassion. So we strongly encourage you to, to visit uh, the site and, and, and share your own story. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and uh, we will try to answer them. So here is a question. I can read it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the notion of an empathic museum emerged, a people-centered organization and an institution with a clear vision of its role in the community, inspired by values such as inclusion, social justice, equality, and representation. Empathicmuseumweebly.com. So the question here is, do empathy and compassion mean the same thing? Uh, and what do you think is the difference between compassion and empathy? Well, you start. Okay. Yes. Um, well, this is uh, supported by by a lot of research and and also how how researchers tend to define these concepts. Empathy is 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 a uh, amazing human trait, but but it, it mostly refers to our our ability to to for fellow feeling to actually sort of we mirror each other's feelings and we feel. Uh, what other people feel. Uh, and this is certainly a very uh, important part of compassion, but, but compassion is a bit uh, even broader uh, concept where con uh, compassion involves also the desire to act upon this empathy and, uh, and uh, act in a way that could alleviate and, and help other people with their suffering and their pain. So, so I think um, this is also how why we view compassion as a as a as an action, 
and, and not only as a, as a sort of feeling. But of course, in everyday speak, people use this in a sort of similar manner. But, but now we, we, we fall back on, on, on research and, and how scholars tend to define this. Yes, I agree. Also in organization studies, compassion is used because it's enactment. It's not only something you think. Hmm? Are there any other questions, comments, stories you want to share? We have had some positive comments here, but yeah. uh, thank you for those. Thank you. Yeah. Do you go to this website and our wish is that it would have then hundreds and thousands of stories from all over the world where we can share and see that these acts of compassion are important. So everybody can see we are, that humankind is a human kind. So I think if there are no more questions, we would like to thank you for following, for watching and following this seminar or webinar. And we wish you all a nice weekend and a su good summer here in Finland. It's very warm now. At this, uh, in the north, we're still very warm. So good weekend and do some acts of compassion today. Thank you so much. Thank you.